the myth that is the knowledge economy. Many, including myself, argue that we're living in a knowledge economy. But we're not. At least, not yet. Knowledge has always been a key component in any successful and sustainable business model. The experience in growing crops or raising cattle, the science and skills in drilling for oil or mining ore, the creativity in designing consumer products or adverts aimed at specific market segments. But today, perhaps more than ever before, knowledge can be the sole driver of a business activity. The likes of Amazon, Google, Facebook don't manufacture anything. They turn information about their users into valuable knowledge for marketers and advertisers. Yet, at the same time, they generate a lot of value to hundreds of millions of their users, which they simply give away for free. Why? Because it is simply impossible to determine the market price of one search or one post. Let's explore this in more detail. Knowledge, like beauty, is in the eye of the beholder, which means that the value of knowledge can only be determined in light of the context in which it is to be used. For instance, learning to fly a plane could suit my leisurely interests, the value of which I could weigh against visiting Machu Picchu or owning a Harley Davidson bike. In another situation, it could be an invaluable life-saving skill, not only to me but to others too. So, what is interesting but otherwise useless to you right now could become extremely relevant and therefore valuable tomorrow or next week or next year. It all depends on your context. Also, the more you use that skill or knowledge, the more it becomes valuable. So, in fact, the more you should pay for it to whomever gave you that skill or knowledge. But the kicker is, you don't always know upfront where and when or how often you will use it. As a consequence, the value of knowledge cannot be determined at the time it is acquired, but only as and when it is used, every time it is used, in whichever context. And therefore, you should only have to pay for it at the time of use, not at the time of acquisition. But our current market mechanisms don't work like that. We're not used to that, except perhaps in the music and entertainment industry. Musicians earn royalties that are paid to and collected by performance rights organizations based on the actual playlists of radio stations and events. Current information and communication technologies now make it possible to log and keep track of who shares what knowledge, with whom, and when and how it is used. It opens a door for determining the price of knowledge at the time it is used a price that is fair and in proportion to its value to both the buyer and seller of that knowledge. Consider how this could work in the world of consulting or training, both knowledge-based businesses by excellence. Currently, they sell knowledge in the form of advice or presentations and exercises, but only charge for the time spent in sharing that knowledge. While they may charge different hourly rates, this still has no direct bearing on the value of what their clients will do with the advice or knowledge. Nor do these clients have the possibility to resell or indeed return what they bought in case it does not meet their purpose. Sorry, no refunds. What should happen instead is that the consultants and trainers not only sell their time, indeed a scarce resource, but also and separately their knowledge. If the client never gets to apply the advice or knowledge, or it simply doesn't yield added value, no additional payment should be due. Conversely, if added value is indeed realized, whether in terms of additional revenues, higher margins, higher productivity, cost savings, or other means, then the consultant or trainer should get a proportional and thus fair remuneration. What remains to be negotiated is, of course, the size of that proportional reward. Consider for a moment how market risks are affected. When you're looking for knowledge and expertise, but you're not sure you will find exactly what you're looking for, you will have a hard time determining what you would be willing to pay up front for getting it. This is called information asymmetry. At the time of the exchange, the buyer has little or no idea of how valuable that knowledge will eventually be. This puts downward pressure on what the buyer should be willing to pay for that knowledge. In contrast, the seller has no way to demonstrate or prove the true value of the knowledge in the context of the buyer, short of already sharing and applying it. 
the risks are therefore significant for both buyer and seller. If instead payment for knowledge is made contingent on future benefits as and when those are realized, then effectively the risk on the buyer that the knowledge bought may not bring added value has all but disappeared and will be limited to the payment of the consultant's or trainer's time. Conversely, the risk on the seller is limited to the buyer not actively putting the knowledge to work and therefore realizing much fewer benefits than perhaps anticipated. But the upside is unlimited and at any rate the time spent will be paid for. Watch this space. A project is currently underway, supported by the European Commission's Horizon 2020 program, to create a market for knowledge where knowledge is shared under Creative Commons license and paid for as and when it is used. A fair payment in proportion to the value it creates for the buyers. Want to know more? Contact me at Philippe Laliert at nolia.com. That's P H I L I P P E dot L E L I A E R T at K N O W L I A H dot com.